Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is high noon, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for uh, participating in our Build Your Armor series. My name is Mark Pettis, and I serve as Director of Population Health and Community Care at Berkshire Health Systems. Uh, and it's a real joy to be having a little time uh, today to be talking to you, sharing with you about the uh, concept of food as medicine and reviewing with you what I think uh, is some really interesting research that has a lot of implication for uh, health and quality of life and longevity. And as nutritional science uh, can be very confusing with lots of sort of conflicting points of view, I, I hope I can bring some clarity to that for you and, and for those you love. And uh, I will say that um, much of what I will be sharing with you is very deeply grounded in the nutritional research fields. And um, there's a lot of great news to use here. So this is the second week of our um, eight week series and all of our webinars will be um, archived. So um, if you wanted to review them again or share them uh, with friends or family, uh, feel free to do so. And again, uh, today we're gonna look at uh, some nutritional science. And uh, this is just the rest of the uh, series. And you can see we've got a, a really great cadre of presenters and topics. So we, it was, 2,500 years ago, uh, literally about 500 BC, that Hippocrates, who, who many consider to be the father of medicine, uh, said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Uh, like most physicians, I probably had a couple of hours in my entire medical training, four years of medical school, three years of residency training, two years of specialty fellowship, uh, you know, four years of pre-med undergraduate. Unless you were a nutrition major during your college years, you were not likely to get a whole lot of formal nutritional education during your uh, medical training. And that says all you need to know about where our system places its priorities. And yet we've known for millennia that the foods that we eat and as I'm going to share with you, when we eat have very powerful impact on human biology and human health. So we're going to take this very old concept and put it into a contemporary spotlight. Many of you who've heard me talk have, have seen this slide before. I use it often. And it serves to just sort of summarize what I think our current understanding of, of human biology is. And this is a very different understanding than um, what most physicians and most clinical caregivers have been taught. A lot of this has just emerged over the last five years, maybe 10 years tops. But in the perennial debate around what's more important, nature or nurture? Is it the genes? Is it what you in inherited that you came into the world with that has the greatest dominance over how long you live or how well you live? Or is it in fact the nurturing piece, uh, your environment? And I would say the pendulum has swung significantly toward the nurturing piece. It's, it's increasingly clear that lifestyle and environment, how we eat, when we eat, how we move, how we sleep, how we interpret and respond to stress in our lives, how connected we are with under, other individuals, particularly if those connections are in the context of loving and supportive and safe relationships, the burden of toxins that may be in our environment, all these aspects of our lifestyle and environment appear to be the most critical contributors to how long we live and how well we live. And nutrition, what is on the end of your fork and what is in the cup that, you, that you're drinking your beverage from are major, major players in this nurture domain. And we've come to realize, and this is largely through the emerging field of epigenetics, 
that our choices, our lifestyle and environment will take what we have inherited and will either make more likely that that inheritance will manifest or we may have the opportunity to fully suppress the manifestation of something we may have inherited, like a risk for diabetes or a risk for Alzheimer's or a risk for heart disease. So the current understanding is suggesting that lifestyle, environment, our choices play a, a much greater role in our health, in our longevity, in our quality of life, and it does so by influencing the book of life we inherited. And it makes us the authors of that book of life. It's not just what your parents' book of life was like. Uh, we become the authors of our books of life. And as it turns out, many of the chapters awaiting us are chapters that we are writing day to day, moment to moment. These are not chapters that are already filled in and preordained. Epigenetics is how the outside gets inside. And this is a powerful lever to be thinking about your self-care. The most recent addition to this understanding has been the understanding that the microbiome, which is essentially an ecosystem of organisms, mostly bacteria, but some viruses, some fungi that exist in our skin, in our mouths, in our um, largely in our colon, most of these are in our intestinal tract. All of these organisms, as it turns out, are very much a part of who we are. We're part human, part microbe. And when you look at the numbers of microbes that we coexist with, and you look at the amount of DNA that those microbes contain, we're really much more microbe than we are human uh, from the perspective of our biology. And that's a bit of a mind bender, but the point that I'm going to make here is that the food that you eat can take your book of life, your genes, and epigenetically fine tune it in a way that can serve you better or not. In the same way, what you eat and what you drink will have a significant impact on the diversity and balance of your microbiome. And we are now understanding that that too is a critical driver of most of the fault lines, metabolic fault lines like inflammation or high insulin, insulin resistance. We might call that pre-diabetes, diabetes. diabetes. Um, all of these diagnoses are very much under the influence of these microbiologic ecosystems. Um, and so this is a very interesting interplay of how the environment alters the bacteria, how it alters our genes, and ultimately our lives emerge at this interesting intersection, all of which is under the influence of what some might call the spiritual dimension of our lives, that which gives us meaning, purpose, um, consciousness. These are a bit abstract, um, but consider the fact that your thoughts and whether your thoughts are negative and fear-based versus thoughts that may be more positive uplifting and um, hopeful will have a very different effect on your DNA. Will also influence uh, perhaps the foods that you choose. So we still have a lot to learn about how we work and function as human beings, but what's clear is that we are largely the authors of this book. We are largely the owners of this life and lifestyle you know, a physician, a good hospital, a medical system can only take one so far uh, along this journey, which is what population health is all about. And, and that's a subject for another time. So our lives emerge from interactions that are very active, very malleable. You can take a genetic risk and literally turn it off uh, by virtue of better alignment of lifestyle choice with whatever that risk may be. So we do not have to be prisoners of our DNA. This is a liberating model of, of health. And I, and I believe I shared this slide last week, 
The point of this is that your life today, you know, a little after noon here on September 16th in this crazy year of 2020, the moments to come later today, tonight, tomorrow, the days, weeks, months, years ahead, can take on an infinite number of possible manifestations. You are not locked in to a particular trajectory. And depending on the nature of the relationship between your unique biology and the environment and choices that you make, your experience of life will manifest in a very different way, which is what this slide projects. Same book of life, same double helix, two entirely different human beings and two entirely different experiences of life contingent on the nature of these relationships. And we're learning a lot more about what our lives will be like at the age of 75, 80, heavily influenced by choices we make throughout our lives. And so who we are and who we become uh, is a, a very dynamic process and always within the realm of possible change. This is a very empowering story. One of the challenges in modern life, and one of the reasons I believe that we have seen an explosion of chronic complex diseases from obesity affecting 70% seven, uh, of our population, overweight obesity, diabetes affecting you know, 12 plus percent of our population, pre-diabetes 35%, hypertension, 50, 60, 70%, depending on your age. Alzheimer's now uh, affects over 5 million people um, a year and, and continues to grow. Um, these chronic complex diseases, in my view, represent a growing disconnect between our biology and that which it has been evolved to be in relationship with, in the generations that preceded us to an environment today that has a very significant mismatch. There are foods in our environment that may not be too unfamiliar to you or I. I mean, I grew up on Pop-Tarts and uh, packaged foods and I would, I would trade whatever sandwich my mother made for me for a Twinkie or a Ring Ding. I mean, that was just a no brainer. I mean, these were relatively new to nature foods. And I'm going to make the, the case that most of the foods in our modern food supply are relatively unfamiliar to the ancient biology that we embody. And even though you may think your biology is only as old as your age, that which you inherited goes back hundreds of thousands of years and has been passed down generation after generation. You know, you have a family tree that goes back several thousand generations in your modern humanity. They were accustomed to a very different food environment than the one that we are currently in. So I would make the case that the rate of change in our food supply has exceeded our biologic ability to adapt. And though that's not the only reason why we tend to feel worse as we get older or confront diseases, uh, which seem almost inevitable if we live long enough, um, as it turns out, uh, you, this, these are not inevitabilities. And when you look at cultures who consume the same foods today as they did generations ago, the Okinawans, uh, for example, uh, the Papua New Guineans, uh, the Hadza, there are many cultures all around the world that continue to live long lives uh, with very little chronic disease. And we're all gonna die of something, but most of us want to have a pretty good quality of life up until that something happens. And that really has been our lineage um, up until the last, I'd say, three or so generations. So I would start from the perspective of, and there are no particular order here, but the, one of the greatest changes in the modern human diet has been the widespread introduction of processed grain, processed carbs. Uh, these are uh, what I would call very high glycemic carbohydrates that you consume within a very short time that are high glycemic will cause a rapid rise in the sugar in your blood and in the insulin in your blood. 
And we know that over time, perpetually high sugar and insulin levels will accelerate your aging and put you at much greater risk for almost every chronic complex disease. Now about 50, 55% of what the average human consumes in the standard American diet would fall into the category of these high glycemic carbohydrates, sugar, all flour-based foods. But I put wheat here specifically because wheat is one of the uh, most common grains in, our, in, in the commodities we produce. And if you wanted to do just one thing and you did nothing more than just this one thing, and if you did nothing more than just this one thing for say 30 days, and if that one thing were stopping all wheat consumption in whatever form that might be, and then notice how you feel at the end of that month, in my experience, in the published research, uh, and certainly in my own life, nine, 95 out of 100 people are going to notice remarkable changes. Um, so many of the grains in our food supply, even whole wheat, are different today than they were back in biblical days. You know, these are not the same types of grain. And, and most of the things that are made from these grains, from the breads, the cereal grains, pasta, pastries, you know, things that taste great, things that we all love. And, you know, I'm a carbohydrate addict and have been for, you know, most of my life. Uh, I was drinking Coca-Cola uh, and eating Pop-Tarts when I was 10 years old. I mean, that was not an uncommon breakfast for me. Uh, my mother had lots of health issues. We were often on our own in the morning. Uh, and that's the way that it was. And um, so these are foods that will be unforgiving uh, with respect to your biology and ultimately your health. Now, fruits, all fruits are better than processed foods, but some fruits do have a higher sugar and fructose content. And, you know, bananas, grapes, pears are just examples of that. Um, Again, a fruit is always a good choice, uh, but if you're trying to lose weight or if you're dealing with uh, pre-diabetes, diabetes, you're on medicine for your, your sugar, uh, I'd be a little more selective and, and you know, we'll look at that. Dry fruits are really just sugar bombs. There's, there's really no nutritional value of most dry fruits. I, I you know, you could be eating a donut uh, and uh, getting pretty much the same nutritional value. Yeah, there may be a few more nutrients in dry fruit, but these are very high glycemic foods. Don't be fooled by packaging to suggest that these are health foods. Certainly sweetened soft drinks. I think everyone is aware there's just a lot of research suggesting that this is one of the huge drivers of obesity and metabolic disruption in young children, adolescents. Um, you know, this is, this is very well known and very well established. You know, beer is liquid bread. Uh, it, it is a, this is a very high glycemic carbohydrate. Uh, and, you know, if you like alcohol, and I'll talk about alcohol in a, in a little bit, but, um, I, you know, I'd be very careful about um, too much beer. If, in fact, your health goal uh, is to uh, lose weight, uh, maybe to reduce your um, sugar, uh, to reduce your um, medications, uh, blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. If you want more energy, if you want less brain fog, if you want less pain, there are very few quality of life issues that aren't significantly enhanced by um, moderation or elimination of, of beer and looking for alternatives if in fact, um, you know, you like a, a social drink. Uh, you know, starchy vegetables, again, are always better than processed foods, but sometimes, um, again, if you're trying to lose weight or if you're thinking about keto, keto is just a, a kind of a, an extreme of low carbohydrate. Um, so a ketogenic diet is one that just restricts carbs even more significantly, usually less than 50 grams a day of all carbs, um, even less than that in some instances, less than 30 grams a day. When one does that, their body begins to produce ketones. And a lot of the research would suggest that ketones and these diets can be very, very effective for weight loss, 
for managing and even reversing type two diabetes. There's a growing body of research looking at this for cancer care, looking at this for degenerative neurologic issues like Alzheimer's. Um, I, I could go on and on about this. Um, I've done keto, uh, I, I tend to go in and out. And, uh, uh, but really it's about restricting carbohydrate. If one really does that in a more significant way, then you might become keto. And uh, again, this can be powerfully health promoting, but you always wanna be working with someone who, who can help you navigate and can choose wisely. Uh, and, and again, we know that these approaches can lower insulin inflammation, which are the passports to aging for, for most of us. In much the same way, I do think, and I know a lot of my colleagues um, may not agree with me on this, uh, and I know that this uh, also contradicts what have been many of the guidelines for some time now, um, but I do think there is a growing awareness that Condemning fat without looking at the source of that fat, I think has been overstated. And fat has no effect on insulin or sugar. And I would make the case that if you're choosing fat of better quality, um, grass-fed produced dairy, uh, meats, avocados, olive oil, free-range um, eggs and egg yolks, you know, fatty fish, salmon, trout, mackerel, coconut, coconut oil, um, you know, grass-fed meats, nuts. Uh, these can all be really powerful nutritional sources. And as one lowers their carbohydrate level, it really becomes important to be able to choose more fat because you know, we have to consume something. Fat is very satiating it will diminish those peaks and valleys of high sugar, low sugar. Uh, you know, years ago, I used to eat a bowl of raisin bran and two slices of whole wheat bread and a glass of orange juice. And you know, this, this was what was recommended by the AHA. It had the heart healthy seal. Uh, you know, had I checked my sugar afterwards, it would have been off the charts. Uh, within a few hours, I was ready for a nap. I was so tired, hungry all the time. That is the effect that those poor quality carbs can have. Quality fats have the opposite effect. Very satiating, they reduce appetite. Uh, they have a very neutral effect on insulin. And it's very hard to burn fat without consuming more fat. I know that's sort of counterintuitive. Um, but to burn fat, one has to lower insulin. And the fastest way and most effective way to do that is to cut out those poor quality carbs and to begin to allow healthier sources of fat into your diet, many of which are just right delicious and fantastic and, and again, very satiating. And there are a lot of wonderful options there. And um, uh, this is just to remind me that your cows are pretty interesting animals, right? The, these ruminants. And isn't it amazing that a cow can convert grass into heavy cream? Uh, you know, I get my heavy cream from um, High Lawn Farm. Uh, these are Jersey cows uh, down in Lee feeding off grass. This is really quality dairy. I, I, you know, I just, I, I'm just a fan of, of, that, of, of what they do. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, cows may eat grass, uh, but much of what they produce takes the form of fat, saturated fat. And uh, I think many of these foods are very, very health promoting. Now, there is no substitute for plant-based foods. And, and I know that not everyone eats meat and, or fish or eggs. And there are probably many people that, that are listening to this webinar that may be vegetarian or vegan. And um, I've, I've done vegetarianism for a couple of years and different times in my life. And, and there are many reasons why a person may not want to consume meat, environmental, ethical. There are many environmentally uh, and sustainable ways to get meat and fish and eggs. Um, but, you know, for, for many that, that may not align with where their values are at. And, you know, that's, there's no right or wrong here. There, there are many paths from A to B. And really what I desire to do in this webinar is to give you some principles around which you can discern and look at what might resonate with you, maybe what might not, and uh, tailor 
the choices to maybe work a little bit better for you than, the, than your current choices. But plant-based foods rock. And uh, you know these, these are foods that are very nutrient dense per serving. They have more nutrients uh, than many foods. Um, the fiber is one of the most important aspects of plant-based foods as we understand the microbiome. It is the fiber that the biome in the gut ferments. And the more fiber we consume, the more diverse and balanced that ecosystem. And most cultures that consume more plant-based foods, some of which are fermented, which actually have some of those organisms in them, fermented plant-based foods are really awesome. Um, these are foods that can help your microbiome, provide wonderful nutrients, um, and very, uh, very many studies looking at uh, um, health and the connection here. Um, and again, uh, there's no, uh, you know, this is just a, um, a, a sampling of many different types of vegetables. But, you know, it, uh, sometimes I tell folks two cups of greens a day. I mean, that would be, um, you know, amazing uh, for any human being. Um, many types of vegetables, the cruciferous family, broccoli, cauliflower, collards, cabbage. These are really awesome at supporting liver detoxification um, and um, uh, many other aspects of human health, uh, lowering inflammation, um, the allium family, onions, leeks, garlic. I mean, you know, these are all powerhouse foods. Beans, lentils, um, very affordable, high quality protein. Um, sometimes they do have to be soaked uh, before um, preparation and, and, and cooking, uh, just to be a, a bit better tolerated in the gut. Some people are more sensitive um, in terms of gastrointestinal effects. Uh, so the, the, the preparation can be important there. Again, lower glycemic fruits, you know, berries, grapefruit, kiwi are great choices. Seasonal fruits, you know, Macintosh apples this time of year, uh, you know, nature uh, has produced those for us. Um, uh, and so seasonal and seasonality is always uh, helpful. And again, fermentable foods, uh, be it um, yogurt, sauerkraut, pickled vegetables, whatever that might be, are really awesome health promoting choices. Um, and you know, frozen fruits and vegetables are great as well. So they're very economical. They're just as good nutritionally. And um, you know, if you miss the fresh berries over the, over the fall, winter season, Frozen is always a really good option to consider and very economical. So we touched a little bit on the microbiome. And again, I, I think this is one of the new frontiers of, of medicine. Um, every aspect of human health is now being traced to our biome, including your immune health. Um, and so again, what we know is that um, this ecosystem for many of us has uh, lost its balance. Um, you know, we, we live in a culture that often uh, um, receives lots of antibiotics, which can alter our biome from childhood through adulthood. We have antibiotics in many of the foods that we eat uh, because many um, cattle and chicken are given antibiotics in commercial feedlots uh, that when you consume those, those chicken or those eggs or that beef from those commercial feedlots, you're probably going to get some antibiotic residues. Um, so we, we know that the, the best thing for our biome is to be careful uh, with uh, antibiotics that we may not absolutely need um, to try to choose the cleanest sources we can. Um, and I know for some, this, they, they may not be as affordable. You always have to just examine what's most realistic, and we're all different there, but the extent to which one can um, minimize um, commercially processed uh, meats and eggs, um, getting more plant-based foods, uh, introducing a more fiber, uh, those are things that will really help the biome. And uh, this is just a summary of, you know, about 75% of food in the Western diet is of limited or no benefit to the microbiome. I mean, it's kind of a stunning statement. Again, most of this is in the lower gut. Most of our modern diet is composed of these refined carbohydrates. They get absorbed quickly, they turn to sugar, they drive insulin, weight gain, lethargy, pain, autoimmunity, 
Uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a very slippery slide. And there's so little fiber in the modern diet that very little gets delivered to the colon where this ecosystem is. And so um, this, I think, is on everyone's radar. And uh, we're going to be learning a lot more about this over the next several years. What we do know is that these poor quality carbs, what I call carbohydrate dense foods, grains, processed foods, flour, sugar, when we consume them, the biome in our mouths, in our gut, when they ferment and process these poor quality carbohydrates will drive inflammation, which is essentially turning your immune system in a more unbalanced way. Uh, we want our immune systems turned on if there's a, a, an infection in our environment, but we don't want them turned on many times a day, every day, because of the foods that we're eating. Um, these foods will affect your neurotransmitters, they will affect your mood, they will affect your attention, your ability to focus, they will affect your memory, they will affect your energy, uh, which is why, you know, you consume these foods and guaranteed you'll be re ready for a nap within an hour or two. That is a biologic effect of the food and the metabolic effect of the food after consumption. Uh, and it is these organisms that tend to drive these, your, your mitochondria, your weight. Mitochondria is where you get energy from. And if these foods are your energy source, your mitochondria is gonna be like an oil burner that hasn't been maintenanced in 25 years. It will not be efficient. You will not be able to produce the energy you need. And we all desire more energy. Our lives demand tremendous amounts of energy. So consider the fuel source. Uh, uh, with your next uh, meal or, or snack. And again, our stress response, what I call this HPA, this is the fight flight response. These high glycemic, poor quality carbs will enhance a fight flight response. You know, I, I, I see uh, students up at Williams College and often a student will share with me that at two in the afternoon, uh, they're in their uh, advanced mathematics class and they feel like they're having a panic attack. And uh, I'll, I'll I'll do an inventory of what they're eating, and often they're eating very high glycemic lunches within an hour or two before that attack. And when your sugar goes up and goes down quickly, that will turn on an adrenaline response, which is nasty. Palpitation, sweating, rapid, shallow breathing, just feeling, feeling really poorly. Um, these can all be uh, very nicely managed with alterations of food choice. Now, in much the same way, if you take higher quality carbs, plant-based, nutrient-dense carbohydrates, and you introduce them to the microbiologic flora of the mouth and of the gut, you see a very different response. In this instance, the relationship lowers inflammation. It, it lowers your sugar and insulin. It protects you and improves your diabetes management. It lowers your risk of cancer. Um, it will help you lose weight, burn fat, and maintain that weight loss. These are powerfully opposed metabolic effects that are byproducts by the relationship between the food that you're eating and the microorganisms that are a part of who you are. Now, plant-based foods are well known for their fiber and their nutrients, but I just want to briefly introduce this concept of phytonutrients. Nutritional science um, doesn't, uh, there's, there's a growing amount of research here, but when you look at a food label, uh, you don't see much about the phytonutrients. These are the things that give plants color. Um, it's the things that give plants defense. Plants produce these compounds to defend themselves against predators in their environment. You know, if I'm a, if I'm a, if I'm a, a tomato plant, um, the, the red, the carotenoids that I produce, which gives that tomato plant that beautiful red color, also protect that tomato plant from pests in that plant's environment. And when humans consume plants that have these families of nutrients, they tend to receive many of the same benefits that that plant receives. A tomato plant can't pick up and leave, uh, leave the garden uh, if the pests in the garden aren't uh, to its liking. 
Uh, it has to defend itself. Uh, and, and plants have figured this out over millions of years. Uh, and so these are just different families of these beautiful pigmented compounds. They're chemicals that when consumed, lower inflammation, um, improve the sensitivity of insulin, lowering insulin, improve mitochondrial function, enhancing energy, enhance brain function, are very anti-inflammatory and have great antioxidant capacity. And so these, this is a, 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 a plant kingdom that is very much designed to coexist with us as humans and other species. Uh, and uh, so I, I offer this as just a different way for honoring these amazing foods that uh, Mother Nature has produced for us. And, and we know that in the, in the pharmacology, F-A-R-M, ecology, that um, you know, many of these uh, spices, for example, from black pepper, turmeric, rosemary, ginger, very great anti-inflammatory herbs and botanicals. So I want to just pivot here uh, quickly to the topic of when we eat. The, the average American, and, and this is research um, done by uh, Sachin Panda, P-A-N-D-A. Uh, Sachin is at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. Other, many other people are doing this research now. The average American today will tend to start eating something uh, soon after getting up in the morning, and they'll tend to graze intermittently uh, between meals and at bedtime, and generally right up to bedtime each and every day. So during the wakeful period of the day, the average American is consuming something for about 14, 15 hours. We have the convenience of having things available to us most of the time. Our ancient ancestors didn't do that. They had to hunt and gather for, for what they consumed. And many of these ancestral cultures rarely ate more than one or two, perhaps, uh, meals a day, and predictably had longer periods of overnight fasting. And this has led to a lot of really interesting research and what, what some would call intermittent fasting uh, or some might call time-restricted eating. Um, time-restricted eating for me is a, just an easier concept in that the, the concept is to try to narrow the window within which you are consuming beverage and food. And I would include, you would start the clock with just about anything that you're consuming. Um, I, do, I do give an exception for, um, for black coffee or tea, if you're not adding cream or, or any sugar to it, water. But virtually anything else would start that clock. Time-restricted eating, and a lot of the research that's being done now is looking at closing that window to 10 hours. And there does seem to be some magic that occurs when you start to do that. Um, so when one limits their consumption of food and beverage over that 10 hour period, water, maybe black coffee, plain tea aside, you start to see dramatic changes in health. Um, one thing that happens and starts to happen within a matter of days is you will start to burn more fat. Um, that overnight fasting period and a 10 hour time restricted window implies a 14 hour fast you will have a turning on of your fat burning systems. You will have a turning on of most of your resiliency systems. When we come into the world, you know, if you were a new sort of Apple computer uh, when you were born, you have all kinds of software that's already in, built in to your system. Humans have all kinds of health-promoting longevity, resiliency, software. The problem is the software doesn't get activated or turned on unless we create certain conditions in our choices, in our lifestyle, in our thought patterns, in our emotional management. Um, so a 14-hour fast seems to turn on these resiliency systems, your immune system, 
uh, is, is active and it's surveillance without overreaching, uh, your insulin levels um, come down, your cortisol levels come down, uh, your uh, cells that are aging start to regenerate or recycle. We call that autophagy, that gets turned on. Your mitochondria, um, you know, uh, start to regenerate themselves. You, you literally are recreating a healthier version of you uh, during these fasting states. Um, Ruth Patterson, who's at UC San Diego, uh, and, and women with breast cancer has found that for women who have had breast cancer, uh, who are then randomized to time-restricted eating versus just random eating, 40% reduction in recurrence of breast cancer with time-restricted eating. These are randomized controlled trials. There is no drug that can do that. Um, um, so, th so this is just an example of what is a growing body of research in weight loss, metabolism, diabetes, cancer care, Alzheimer's uh, prevention. Yes, I said prevention. I do believe Alzheimer's uh, for many may in fact be preventable. Um, so this is still very much of an evolving science. But if you combine lowering carbohydrate, particularly those higher glycemic processed carbs with introduction of more healthier fat sources, with an abundance of plant-based foods rich in fiber. And in addition to that, you begin to time restrict over 10 hours, allowing yourself at least two to three hours after your last consumption of the day and bedtime. So a time restriction between say 10 a.m. and um, um, 8 p.m. or you know, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. is probably a little bit better as long as you're allowing yourself a couple of hours after your last consumption and bedtime. That appears to be really important. You don't want to be consuming too close to bedtime. So this, um, I, I think I may have looked at this last week, but um, as this is build your armor, uh, and this is a bit of a summary slide in terms of our immune resilience, metabolic resilience, health promotion. Um, again, whole foods, diversity of foods, um, particularly plant-based, colorful foods, these phytonutrients, lower glycemic uh, effects of, of the foods and beverages that you're consuming, meal timing, these are very powerful in rendering you more metabolically resilient. You will notice dramatic differences. Um, some people, when they restrict their carbs, I should have mentioned this, particularly if they're going keto, can be a little bit more challenging in the first few days. Um, as you withdraw from those carbohydrates. Uh, and that's withdrawal. That is, you know, these are foods that are addicting and they have an addictive biology. Um, and here are some supplements and, and I'll make sure, um, you know, if anyone wants access to these slides that through, through uh, Beth P and Tony, our wellness team, that, that you have availability of these slides, we can get them to you. Again, some supplements, um, you know, cod liver oil continues to rock. Uh, you know, our grandmothers had a lot of wisdom that uh, often they had to force down our throats, uh, you know, two, three generations later. This continues to be a really good source of fat-soluble vitamins, um, which many of us don't get enough of. Um, zinc uh, can be a really important supplement to enhance your immune system, particularly over that uh, fall-winter season. Um, vitamin C uh, in a little bit higher doses here. Probiotics, which are just... Um, a type of healthy bacterial flora. Uh, vitamin D, sun is ideal, uh, but over the long winter season, we, we don't get much ultraviolet light uh, beyond uh, really sort of the end of this month. And so uh, most people that live at our latitude, I think are, are, should be taking a vitamin D supplement if their levels are low. And low would be less than 20. And generally I tell folks, you wanna get those levels up to around 30 or above. So I, before I, I bring this to closure and just get to a few questions, I, I do want to touch on alcohol. And um, one, of the, one of the downsides of the pandemic is that often we, you know, many of us have had certainly a lot of stress and uh, sometimes more time on our hands. And, um, uh, and you know, alcohol can, 
can be a wonderful social uh, sort of lubricant. And, uh, uh, but there's a, there's a very sort of fine line there. And so this is just the latest uh, research. Um, you know, alcohol in any amount for some can be uh, risky, particularly if it's impacting their ability to function, their ability to drive. And, and that continues to be one of the greatest connections uh, and it's, it's toxicity and what are usually traumatic injuries uh, that, you know, can be devastating, of course, as many of you know. But we also know that alcohol consumption beyond moderation, moderation as defined by a drink a day for women, one to two drinks a day for men. Now, the, these are not averages. Uh, that's not to say that, you know, that a guy on Friday night can drink 14 beers and not drink the rest of the week and average two beers a day. These should be upper limits on any given day for any person based on current understanding of the potential risks uh, beyond these amounts. Uh, and these, these again can include uh, high blood pressure. Um, breast cancer is a very strong association with alcohol consumption, um, even with one drink per day. So any woman who's uh, confronting breast cancer, who has a family history, wants to be just particularly careful about alcohol consumption. And so these are guidelines. And again, um, uh, I would see these as reasonable upper limits for anyone on any given day. And this is from the Center for Disease Control, if anyone is uh, interested in the source. So that was a kind of a whirlwind um, tour. Uh, and uh, I know we, we've got several questions and I wanted to make sure we had time to address that. Uh, but I wanted to uh, remind you that next week, my colleague Beth Piantoni will uh, be uh, providing an overview on tips on building exercise into your routine. Uh, you're going to really enjoy that. Um, our wellness team has a great YouTube video page uh, that Beth um, uh, manages, and she's got a lot of great videos on there, uh, just to give her a, 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 a shout out. Um, so uh, I know that you'll really enjoy this next week. And again, this is the schedule for the remainder of the Build Your Armor program. So I am going to uh, just get away from my slides here. And let me just pull up some questions. And, uh, and I will just go through these uh, one at a time in the time that we have left. Um, first question from Ted, and Ted, thank you. Uh, Dr. Pettis, are there any supplements that you recommend for brain optimization and health? That is an awesome question and a, and a very timely question. Uh, it is clear that there are some nutrients that are essential to brain health uh, that many Americans are at risk of not getting sufficient amounts of in their, in their diet. Examples of that would be uh, B vitamins, uh, the, you know, and so a B complex. Um, most of these contain all the B vitamins. A, a 50 milligram B complex uh, can be a really nice supplement for brain health. Um, Omega-3s uh, continue, um, though the research is somewhat conflicting, um, it's quite clear that most Americans do not get enough omega-3s. They get a lot of omega-6s in the forms of vegetable oils, processed vegetable oils, which generally I recommend people um, reduce. Um, so more omega-3s if you're not uh, someone that likes sardines or fatty fish, uh, you know, a, a good omega-3 supplement. And generally I, I recommend uh, 2,000 milligrams a day of omega-3s. Um, again, this may not be for everyone, depending on your diet or or your health or your risk, but, but I think these can be really great uh, brain supplements. Um, I do think intermittent fasting uh, or time-restricted eating, and if you do low carb, higher fat, and your low carb is very low, and you become ketogenic, ketones are amazing nutrients for brain health. Um, and right now there's research looking at ketone supplements. The jury is still out on that, Ted. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll come back with some updates, uh, but those are just some thoughts off the top of my head. Um, another question, um, aren't dried apricots good for you? Um, 
a lot of sugar. Any dried fruit has a lot of sugar. When you are removing the water from that fruit, you are really concentrating the fructose and sugar in the fruit that you are eating. Um, so if you like fruit, I would certainly recommend the whole fruit instead of the dried fruit. So whole apricots, uh, uh, I think uh, a bit better, more nutrients, a uh, little less of that sugar than you'll get with dried apricots. Um, so that's generally what I recommend, uh, whole fruit instead of the dried fruit. Um, these are really not very health promoting. When you say avoid wheat flour, does that mean rye is okay? This is a question from Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie, um, for that question. And, and I, um, I know it's, it's kind of like dropping a bomb when you start condemning wheat, particularly whole wheat. Um, so there are a couple of ways to think about this. Um, wheat specifically, in the way that it is, um, as a commodity, the way that it is grown today is a hybrid wheat. It has a much starchier content. The gluten in it, the gliadin protein, which is gluten, has changed with these hybridizations. Uh, and, and, and I do think there are some people who can be very sensitive to that gliadin, that gluten. And it is a very high glycemic food. Now, rye is also a uh, a carbohydrate dense grain. All grains tend to be mostly carb. Rye is a little lower glycemic than wheat. Whole rye, um, certainly even less so. Um, rye um, uh, can still contain gluten or gliadin. Um, so if one were looking to um, be a kind of a warrior, uh, depending on whatever their health goals are. And if part of that being a warrior meant wanting to gain significant traction on your weight, losing weight around the midsection, having the most powerful impact you could have on your uh, health, inflammation, brain function, quality of life, then I would consider, I would consider an elimination trial a month, see how you do, of all grains, all grains. Uh, and, and so that would include rye, wheat, barley, corn. Um, and again, I know that some of you may just be shaking your head thinking that's just not possible. Um, uh, I once thought that until I did it. Um, so, but, but for, you know, for 30 days, you might be amazed. So rye maybe gets a little bit more of a halo than wheat, uh, but I think you know, these are all grass seeds. Uh, and grass seeds have one purpose in life, to, to, to be hard to, to digest for the species that consumes it. So the species that consumes it will tend to poop it out, which will allow that seed to then grow more of the grain. These are not compatible for a lot of people around consumption and digestion. And we know that many of these grains that are carbohydrate dense do tend to promote some imbalances in the microbiome. So um, I love rye. If I'm going to choose um, a bread, uh, it will be a whole grain rye or maybe a sourdough. Um, but uh, just, that's just my personal choice. Um, but I, I tend to be very cautious with any grain. Um, Rochelle Howe, uh, at the end, can you tell me what you think about monk fruit sugar? Another great question, Rochelle. Uh, monk fruit sugar, I do think, is a really uh, good um, sweetener option. Uh, and I, I didn't have a chance to talk about that, but, um, uh, you know, it, certainly sugar is really problematic. I think most people just understand that. Um, Non-nutritive sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, um, you know, some of the research, and there's not a lot of great research, uh, but some of the research would suggest that um, um, it's definitely an upgrade from sugar sweetened um, additions. Um, it, it, for someone who's trying to lose weight, it's probably a better choice than anything with actual sugar in it. And here I'm talking about, you know, the artificial sweeteners. Um, but they're super sweet, um, 200 to 300 times sweeter uh, than 
many things in nature. And there's something about the effect of that sweetness when it hits the palate of how that affects neurotransmitters in the brain that enhance hunger and even enhance an insulin response in some instances that for some uh, may be problematic over time. So I think monk fruit is a good alternative to artificial sweeteners. Uh, stevia uh, continues to get a bit of a halo. Uh, there's just not a lot of research available there yet. Um, and so what I try to help people with is, um, uh, it, are there ways to look at reducing the sweetness and um, finding more natural ways to do that? And so um, I think monk fruit is a, a fine alternative. Again, I would limit it to the smallest amount that gives you the, the most satisfactory uh, taste that you're, you're looking for. Um, with uh, time-restricted eating, can you still drink water uh, after meals before bed? Um, yes, is the, is, if I'm understanding that question right, uh, Aaron, thank you for asking that. Water um, will not affect those metabolic changes and benefits that you get from fasting. So as long as you're not getting up a lot at night to pee because of the amount of water you're drinking, and that's really more of a quality of life issue, that should not, uh, all the water that you're drinking should not uh, interfere at all with the benefits of a time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting uh, trial. Um, Vicki is asking, do you recommend any grains, um, amaranth, millet? Um, yeah, you know, I, it, some of the ancient grains are um, particularly, and the same is true of wheat. If you can get a, a more ancestral form of wheat, um, uh, Emma or uh, einkorn, um, I, I, you know, I, there may be out there. I, I can't say that I've looked for them in Berkshire County, but I think many of these heritage grains are a bit more forgiving. Um, uh, and I might add to that even things like buckwheat, um, you know, quinoa, these are sort of pseudo grains. Um, if, if that said, if somebody's trying to lose weight, if somebody is a diabetic, and, and requiring medication to lower their sugar, I would still be careful with any um, carbohydrate dense food. Not that I would eliminate it. I realize that may just be too far a stretch for some, but I would certainly try to moderate it. And I do think some of these ancient grains are a reasonable uh, choice. Um, question from Nora, and I've got just a few minutes left. I wanna be mindful of the time. I'm a vegan and a runner. Um, uh, I take a uh, glucosamine chondroitin for healthy joints. What are your thoughts on this supplement? Um, there have been a lot of randomized controlled trials looking at glucosamine and chondroitin for healthy joints, and they, they do seem to help some people. Um, most of the benefits have been in people with mild to moderate osteoarthritis, uh, where they do tend to realize less pain uh, in general at rest and with activity. Uh, and, and better activity tolerance. And so I think for someone who's really active, as you appear to be, Nora, that they can be. And um, I applaud your vegan. Uh, I, I certainly uh, hope that I didn't come across anti-vegan in, in some of these suggestions. Um, there, there are many ways, uh, as you know, of, of getting amazing nutrient-dense foods and promoting health and maintaining the ethical integrity that you know, that's so important. Um, but yes, chondroitin, I think, is a, a fine supplement. Um, Kimberly asks, is uh, gluten-free one-minute oatmeal safe to eat? Uh, I, you know, I don't know how to define safe, but if, if, you're, if you're trying to avoid a glucose spike, uh, an insulin spike, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to improve your health, this is not likely to be a very good choice. Um, I have tried using a continuous glucose monitor and I've recommended it to some of our employees at Berkshire Health Systems and uh, many who eat even steel cut oats and steel cut oats are, are a better choice, I believe, than any instant uh, oatmeal. Um, 
people are stunned at how high their sugars get after, after eating uh, oatmeal. So again, um, it, it, it's comfort food. I love it, um, but I tend to moderate it. And if I'm eating oatmeal, I go with steel cut and, and slow cooking. Uh, and usually I'll add some higher fat or protein to try to reduce the uh, glycemic effect of that. Uh, and I think I've got time for, for one more uh, question. Um, you know, what about brown rice and quinoa? Um, I mean, these are all great questions. And um, brown rice has always gotten the, uh, the halo compared to white rice because it, it has the, the it, it, it has the brand, it has the, the fiber. Um, the, um, you know, it, it, there are so many layers to this, but, but a lot of brown rice uh, can, comes from places, Southeast Asia, China, uh, where you can see higher arsenic levels. Um, white rice, uh, less so because it, 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 you know, it's, that has been polished, it's been eliminated. And it is interesting to me, and, and a lot of the, the uh, nutritional people I talk with and anthropologists that I work with that deal with ancestral cultures, I mean, you cannot go to Southeast Asia or China. They, they don't eat brown rice. They don't eat brown rice in these places because I think they've come to realize through the generations that the gut just does not tolerate them quite as well. And, and I know that's probably a little bit controversial. Um, I used to always recommend brown rice over white rice. Um, I tend, to, I tend to go with a, with a basmati, a bit of a, of a cleaner rice, and um, that, that's just my opinion. Quinoa, I think, is a great choice. It's kind of a pseudo grain, um, uh, sumptuous and, and affordable and nutrient dense. And uh, anyhow, uh, and uh, before I conclude, I, I just, a, a quick comment from, my, from a good friend, an amazing colleague, Deb up in Williamstown. Um, I've done this elimination for two and a half years and Mark is absolutely correct. It has worked for me, size three times um, to 10. Yeah, um, thank you again for hosting these. And, uh, and thank you all for listening in. That was a lot for one hour. Um, you know, stay the course, keep the faith, stay positive. Uh, it's gonna be a great fall and winter, I believe that. And, uh, 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 and um, I hope you enjoyed this series. And for the questions I didn't get a chance to get to, I'll try to find out the contact information from those individuals and a reply by email. So have a great day, peace, and uh, stay well. Thank you, Mark.